Chapter 8 The Cat Girl Cabby. Let's walk while we talk, stinky humanoid, Imelda said as she led the way. So, what are you? I've never seen your kind before. You look very strange. No tail, no wings, no fangs. What are you? Ryuga wasn't entirely sure how to answer the question. No fangs? No tail? Well, it was true that he was now traveling with two beast-like humans. She did have a fair point, as strange as this seemed to him. He had to admit that he probably seemed more foreign to both of them. I'm a human. Ryuga finally responded. Oh, a human. That's good. I thought for a moment you might be a hairless ape. Parisius said as she followed closely behind Ryuga. I mean, that may not be too far from the truth. Ryuga muttered to himself. Of all the 32 races within the world, I've never heard of human. Not even among the extinct races. Interesting. One mystery down, just a dozen more to solve. So, what are you doing in the middle of Sen Beast territory? Imelda then inquired. I have no idea what a Sen Beast is. As far as how I got here, well, that's kind of a complicated story. Well, something tells me we will have a ton of time. May as well start explaining. Imelda replied. And so, Ryuga recounted the events which led to his awakening in this strange area. By all accounts, you sound very lucky, Ryuga the Stinky. That creature you described, it sounds like a rare Sen beast. Imelda commented after hearing Ryuga's tale. Wow, really, Sensei? What type can make itself disappear? Parisia asked. Draconic types have that ability. It sounds like our new acquaintance here was attacked by a worm. A worm? You mean like a baby dragon? Ryuga asked in disbelief. Exactly. Some of them are known to have unique powers. It's not too difficult to imagine one could conceal itself. In fact, turning camouflage isn't an uncommon ability for Sen Beasts to have. In fact, one of the scariest things about Sen Beasts is that unless you're attuned to nature, you can't even sense their presence. Pay attention, stinky human. She's not recapping the basics for my sake. Parisius said with a glee-filled grin. Do I really smell that bad? Ryuga asked, finally fed up with their name callings. Yes! They immediately answered in unison. Well, we're back. Let's go inside. Besides, dinner should be ready anyway. Imelda said as she walked towards the door of her straw hut. Once inside, she invited Ryuga to take a seat on the floor while Parisi attended to dinner. Now, I'm not sure where you come from, but here, on this continent, we have what are known as Sen Beasts. There's a long history revolving around their existence. Needless to say, you don't need to know all of that if your goal is to face Sen Beasts. For now, let's just say they are creatures of immense strength, or unique abilities that prey upon humanoids. That sounds intense, Ryuga said. Indeed, and in order to stand against a Sen Beast, even the weakest of them, you must be trained to a degree. So you see, the likelihood of surviving in a forest, teeming with creatures that are attempting to eat you are very, very low. Imelda segued towards her point. She scanned Ryuga's face for any changes in mood. She didn't expect him to just change his mind, but she needed to at least try. Very well. We'll eat, and then Parisia will take you back to the place she found you. But I need you to promise me two things. One, don't leave Parisia's side. If you do, there's a good chance you might not survive. For someone like you, you may not even be able to see the threats. The second thing is that regardless of the outcome, you must agree to return here should Parisia deem the situation unsafe. The request seemed reasonable, but still, something didn't sit well with Ryuga. He had just gotten close to Akira. He must find her, at all costs. I agree. Good. Now, while we wait for the food, go wash. You smell terrible, human. Imelda said as she pointed to the corner of the room containing a wooden bucket. Ryuga ended up scooping his own water from a nearby well and using a hard bristle brush to scrub. His clothes were indeed caked with all manner of grit, and he imagined that to an animal, he would have a very pungent odor. Imelda poked her head out of the window to toss a martial arts gi out to him. It matched what Parisi was currently wearing, 
now that she'd returned to the hut and gotten comfortable. By comparison, his outfit seemed older and tattered in several places. The fit wasn't bad, a little snug in some areas, but very comfortable. He decided to leave his uniform outside, even his shoes as they still needed to be cleaned. When he finally returned to the hut, both of his new acquaintances were already digging into their meal. What's this? Stew! Imelda replied between mouthfuls. The dish was presented in a wooden bowl. The broth was a purple color, and there seemed to be large chunks of what appeared to be vegetables floating around in it. Not hungry? Parisia asked as she watched him eye the food. It's not that. I've just never seen any of the ingredients in this dish. What are they? Hmm. Imelda said to herself before answering. Vegetables? Various types. Most for spice and some for nutrition. All tasty. Give it a try. She said as she motioned for him to sit. Ryuga did as beckoned and took up a nearby wooden spoon. Indeed, the food smelled savory, but he couldn't identify the scent or any of the spices wafting from the bowl. Nor could he recognize any of the vegetables. He ventured a taste and was pleasantly surprised at the flavor bursting in his mouth. It reminded him of beef stew, but as far as he could see, there was no meat in the bowl. Th this is tasty, he said as he spooned another bite into his mouth. There was no telling just how long he'd gone without real food. He was much hungrier than he initially realized. The trio quickly demolished their soup, with both Parisia and Ryuga going back for seconds. After a few minutes of preparation on Parisia's end, all three of them were now standing in front of the hut. Well, Parisia, you know what to do. Try to make it back before nightfall. It's getting late. Imelda directed as she turned and walked back into the hut, leaving Ryuga and Parisia to their task. Okay, hop on, slightly less smelly human. Parisia said, smirking at Ryuga. I can walk, he said, cutting his eyes at her. No, it's too far to walk, and you're much too slow, she replied. Well, that may be true, but can you really carry me, especially if it's that far away? Ryuga asked. I carried you here with no problem, so shut up and let's get going, Parisia said as she motioned for Ryuga to hop on. So embarrassing. He muttered to himself as he hopped on, piggyback style. Well, let's get to it. Ryuga didn't even have time to make a wisecrack before Parisia had begun to move. Ryuga was in awe at the way Parisia moved. It was almost as if he weighed next to nothing. She moved so effortlessly, dashing through the forest as she leapt over logs and rocks. Gradually, after a half hour, the forest grew more dense and the trees seemed to get thicker as well. The sun was beginning to set. Would they make it back to the hut in time? We're almost there, she shouted as the duo continued on their way. From here on out, don't make any noise unless it's absolutely necessary, Parisia cautioned. Otherwise, we may run into trouble we don't want. Ryuga complied with Parisia's orders as he clung to her for dear life. The ride was smooth, but the speed at which she moved had made his grip go numb. He resorted to a sort of full-body hug just to remain safe. This looks like the place, Parisia whispered as she landed near what appeared to be a small crater. This is where I found you, she said, letting Ryuga down. His first order of business was to stretch. Staying in the same position for longer than 30 minutes wasn't easy to do on the best of days, let alone riding on the back of a Nekoma. Ryuga carefully looked around, looking for a sign, a shred of proof that Akira had even been here. He silently moved around the perimeter of the crater, his eyes searching for anything, and eventually he found what he was looking for. This, he whispered to Parisia as he held up a scrap of Akira's school uniform. He could tell it was a female's outfit due to the embroidery, no doubt a piece of her shirt or collar. This is Akira's, Ryuga said excitedly as he handed the small scrap of cloth to Parisia who began to sniff it. Indeed, this scent isn't yours. But there was no one else here when I found you, smelly human. Parisia sniffed the cloth again, and then added, I'm glad to see not all you humans are smelly. Ryuga was too excited to pay much attention to the cat girl's jabs. This was proof that Akira was nearby. He needed to find her no matter what. Let's go. Can you follow the scent on this piece of garment? He whispered to Parisia. Maybe. 
The scents aren't my forte, but I'll see what I can do. She placed a strip of cloth into her waist pouch and motioned for Ryuga to follow. The two moved through the dense forest trees for what seemed like an eternity. Ryuga could feel his impatience growing with each passing moment. His thoughts had begun to spiral into a frightening sequence of what-ifs. What if she woke up alone and wandered into a bad situation? How long had he even been knocked out? Maybe she was already. He refused to think about the worst-case scenario, but he had to admit that Imelda made some very interesting points. How far does this forest extend? Ryuga asked suddenly. Not sure. I just know it's very, very vast. It's easy to get lost in a place like this if you don't know where you're going. Parisia replied as she continued to lead the way. After several more anxiety-filled moments, Parisia came to a stop and turned around. The scent ends here, she said, gazing about a small clearing. What, what do you mean? Ryuga asked as his heart began to sink. I mean, I can no longer track the scent. There is no clear direction to follow. Is, uh, is there anything you can do? Please, I know I'm asking a lot. I just, we had just gotten on good terms. I can't just leave her out here all alone. This scrap of clothing is proof that Akira made it to this place with me. I must find her. Parisia seemed to relate to Ryuga's situation. He noticed her careful consideration as she weighed the options. I... She began. Fifteen minutes. That's all I can spare. We'll travel in this direction for as fast and as far as we can go for another fifteen minutes. If, within that time, we haven't found any trace of this Akira, we will call off the search and return. That's all I can do, Ryuga. Thank you. Thank you so much, Parisia, Ryuga said as he grasped her hands and bowed his head. Parisia seemed a little unsure as to how to take this show of gratitude, causing a slight blush around her cheeks. It's nothing, she said, turning her back to him and motioning for him to get on once more. Soon the two were off yet again, the light of sunset quickly sinking behind the horizon. Sleeping Dragon King Chronicles by Kenneth Flanders Jr. Narrated by Peter Widener. Chapter Zero, Futures Past. It's time. Are you ready? The young Nikomata asked her ears twitching beneath her hooded cloak. She was speaking to a young man who was sitting near the edge of a cliff, gazing out across the distance. For a moment, he didn't show any sign of acknowledgement. Perhaps he was pulled into the beauty of the sunset, the crimson and gold colors that only heaven can provide prior to dusk. In actuality, the young man, though his body was still and calm, struggled with racing thoughts, his heart